I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer for Gold Derby, and I'm joined today by the sound team from The Woman King, re-recording mixer Tony Lamberti, supervising sound editor Becky Sullivan, and production sound mixer Derek Mansvelt. Um, so before we dig into the movie in uh, more detail, I think it would be uh, quite helpful if each of you briefly explained, you know, what your individual role was specifically on this movie, since, you know, despite being in the same department, your roles all differ from one another. So Tony, let's start with you, and then whoever would like to follow can just go ahead. Okay, uh, my job primarily is to take all the um, final sound effects tracks, sound design, um, and take all those things that Becky Sullivan has prepared and some of the material that uh, Derek has prepared or captured on set and uh, take all those elements in a uh, theater mixing environment and mix them with the director, picture editor, Becky, myself, Kevin O'Connell, who is the other re-recording mixer on this who did music and dialogue and we shape the sound for the film. Um, we have you know, hundreds of tracks playing at any given time, and we take all those tracks and, and tell the story that Gina wanted to tell um, about our uh, amazing um, Dahomey Warriors. Then whoever would like to go next, uh, Becky, we can go with you. Hi, so I am the sound supervisor, supervising sound editor. Um, I am the person who pulls together um, the sound of the film. So I am uh, in charge of not only prepping the production dialogue, which is what Derek recorded on set, but also bringing um, hundreds, if not thousands of tracks of, of sound effects um, to the stage for Tony to bring the story to life. Uh, so we are talking about footsteps. We're talking about birds in the air. We're talking about wind. We're talking about uh, battles, cries, and the weapons, and uh, the list goes on and on, but it's shaping, for me, in this film, it's shaping a sonic emotional landscape that envelops the audience in the sound of the Dahomeys and our Goji warriors, and um, and that's that's my job. Perfect, thank you. And then last but not least, Derek? I feel like we should have, we should have ended with you, Becky, because you're the one who puts it all together. So my job is, is in working with Gina on set and with cast and with the locations, with everything we're doing there and script to get as much clean dialogue, especially dialogue. I mean, that's my primary concern. And then obviously any effects that I can get, any atmos that I can get, any tracks, any audio that I feel that might enhance or help Becky to build that world, I will try and record. A lot of it is unfortunately not used, <laughs> but yeah, we, we do our best and we, we get what we can and we've obviously got to fight against all the elements to get that. And then um, we pass it on to post-production and I've got to say that these two people here with us today have done such an amazing job. They've saved some stuff that I never thought would have made it into the show. Um, yeah, that's my job. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for those explanations. I think that'll really help shape this conversation about the movie, which I would like to start by discussing um, the process of creating the Kingdom of Dahomey uh, through sound. And Becky, I would actually like to start with you because you know the film takes place in 1820s Dahomey, which was located within present day Benin, but the movie was obviously shot in South Africa. Um, so you know, what was some of the research you did and what were some of the techniques you used um, to recreate and layer together you know, that sonic landscape that you already mentioned for 1820s Dahomey? Well, um, our challenge was that we were trying to create 1823, mm. but it was filmed in 2021, I believe. So uh, our set uh, there was, you know, in modern day, uh, a city. And so even though we are, they're on a, the set of the kingdom, uh, in my dialogue tracks, what I'm listening to, I'm hearing traffic, helicopters, sirens, uh, we go to different locations and I'm hearing, uh, as Derek will always point out, the smoke machines, uh, the compressors, fans, a lot of bugs, cicadas, a lot of things that were, were just on the production tracks. And so number one is to get all that cleaned out mm -hmm. so that we have a beautiful sounding voice of those actors. And to have that be our first thing is that those voices sound beautiful and rich and we don't touch any of the performance when we weed out all those, those different frequencies of sound. Then it's building the cities and building the life of the Dahomey. So um, it was, a, it was a, a real thing of um, you have the city, 
you have the palace, you have the courtyard of the Agoge, you have the interior of the palace, then you have your jungles and your battlefield. So it's starting from the backgrounds, getting rich backgrounds. So I did a lot of research in birds to make sure that we had the right sound of the right birds, because I will tell you, there are people out there who know what birds live in South Africa. So it's getting, it's doing the research and getting the bird birds that are correct and then placing the birds beautifully throughout. So they don't get on top of any dialogue and yet they envelop the audience and getting the winds correctly and the background sounds of the grasses, right? I mean, there's just so many textures and layers of just backgrounds that we want to envelop the audience with to take them to Africa. And so then Gina was also big on having wildlife sounds. Right. We cut to an elephant here and there and we, we see some, you know, but we don't really have a lot of wildlife and yet we brought them in sonically to help the audience feel that they were in Africa. So of course I could talk about this film for hours, but that is the, the starting base of of the sounds of those of those places, and then the next layer being our heart effects, which is the battles, and you right. know that's that's another story. Absolutely, and we'll get into that a bit later. And I think what you just mentioned is also a perfect segue to Derek, because you know I read that one of the biggest challenges, you know, for everyone was working around all these modern day, um, no, all this modern day noise pollution, because you obviously don't have planes and helicopters and sirens and whatever else in in, in the 1820s. So Derek, you know, um, what did you have to do on location in order to block out or I guess disguise, you know, noises like those? Well, I mean, at, at, at one point, Polly, uh, DOP did sort of come storming around the corner, corner to me and going, can't we do something to mask these smoke machines that she had running right nearby? And I, I sort of stood there and I said, well, we can't, unfortunately, you know, there's no, we can't lay a, a truck over your smoke machine. We can't lay traffic over it. We can't, mm -hmm. it's a very modern sound. So it, it all came down to being able to move things further away. It, 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 so we were under pressure a lot of the time. And a lot of the time we had to kind of go with what we had, but we did move things as far away as possible. We did try and put trucks in front of machinery. Um, I, I, at one point, working in the palace and that became very difficult because we were running two units. So we would have a big crane moving from for another unit to be able to do something while we were trying to film in our unit. So there was a lot of fighting going on wow. and we relied heavily on, on, on ADs. I think the ADs ended up bringing in about four, four new people to run around, try and shut things down because you never knew who was on what radio channel either. You know, you have lights in the part on our, on our set, you've got lights in the part on that set, but you can't talk to each other. So, so <laughs> we, wow. yeah. There were times when it got a little bit hairy and people's tempers flared, but we got through it and we did try our best to keep that down to a minimum. There were times when we had to give up the battle sequences where we knew were always going to be big fans, big smoke machines. And when I say smoke machines, I mean the kind of smoke machines they bring in on a vehicle. So it's, it's, once it gets going, it sounds like you've got a factory next door. Um, yeah, you, you know, we, we did as much as we could like that. Um, there were certain things we couldn't fight against, the, the waterfall, and from right. what Becky said, they saved that. I was absolutely blown away. Um, the one thing nice about something like a waterfall for me is that it's natural. Mm -hmm. So it can be part of our world. You know, when we were in the castle, so the whole of, of um, the port town is right in the center of Cape Town, which mm -hmm. is a city. There's ambulances going past, there's police vehicles going past, there's sirens, there's train line nearby. There are helicopters flying overhead. We, we, we kind of had to go with what we had when we couldn't use it. We just had to ask Gina, we would need another one or we would have to get a wild track. We did as much as we could. But yeah, it, it was a, it's, I mean, that's, my, that's our job. That's what we do. It's, mm -hmm. it's relentless. It doesn't stop and you're tired by the end of it, but you just got to keep going and just hope that you can get it. And if you can't get it, you bring in wild tracks, do this, do that. Yeah, there's, unfortunately, there's no cure for, for those kind of mm -hmm. things. But hey, it turned out really well. So uh, I think everything worked. Well, <laughs> thanks to post-production, to Becky, Tony, everybody on that side who, who I, I must say, some of the, the, the scenes that I've heard they've saved, I was very, mm -hmm. I was blown away. 
Yeah, and you know, let's go to Tony because uh, while preparing for this interview, I really went back and paid close attention to those first 15, 20 minutes of the movie because I think that initial introduction to the kingdom of Dahomey is so inviting and, and almost heartwarming in a way because you can just feel with how much reverence, you, you know, everyone brought this place to life and you know, how its vivacity is really highlighted. So Tony, talk a bit about uh, you know, how, that came, how that intro came together in the mix and how Terrence Blanchard's uh, amazing score you know, really contributed to this whole atmosphere. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the movie kicks off with um, the, uh, the village battle where the, the Agoji show up to uh, get back some of their people. And, um, you know, it, so we so we kick it off, you know, very strong right away. We show these women warriors um, really going at it and uh, they come in, take over this village. Um, and then from there, they it kind of calms down and settles into um, coming back to the palace coming back to Dahomey and and kind of then using that kind of release tension and release to then settle in we're going on their journey and then using uh the tracks that Dick Becky described in terms of the backgrounds really making sure that we hear everything all the activity that's going on in the village everything that's going on in the palace each one of those things has a very distinctive sound mm -hmm. to its own kind of thing. The courtyard where the Agoji are mostly by themselves has a very distinctive sound in terms of the chatter and all that stuff, which Becky was able to find amazing. You know, not only do we have Derek's great production recordings, but then we also have Becky had scoured the globe to find these amazing, very, very specific um, uh, women chatting the correct language, the correct amount. Like, I, I, she just amazed me how she came up with this. But, and so we just place those things in the spaces and and that kind of then settles you into to the, the vibe of, of the, their lives and this, this world that we're building. And then from there, then we start escalating. You know, we learn about, you know, their, 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 their um, tension with the oils. We, and, then, and then from there, we just uh, go on this amazing ride. Yeah, absolutely. And you already mentioned, you know, the opening battle scene, and we obviously have to talk about uh, the battle scenes in this movie, which are of such great scale, and they're all so different from each other. And, you know, Becky and Derek, I would like to, uh, I want to go to you first, because I'm really interested, you know, in some of the work that was done on location in terms of, for example, positioning the mics, and, and then to what extent, you know, some of the sounds um, that we hear in the battle had to be created or pre-recorded. So whoever of the two of you would like to take that one first. The, the problems we encountered, you, you mentioning mics and packs and things, yes, we, we, um, <laughs> we had a lot of help from costume department. We had a cast who were, were incredibly helpful as well. I mean, we, we hid microphones in plain sight. We, um, I, amazingly, just before we started, I've been in search of, of almost like a sports tape that we kind of used to stick microphones to bodies. I needed shades of different colors sort of light brown, dark brown, I needed these. And I, I haven't been able to find them for years. I mean, being in South Africa and working here mainly, it's something that would be helpful for me and I've always wanted it. I literally found a whole range of different colors just before we started. Wow. And I, I mean, that, that, was, that was a good omen in my mind because we suddenly had this tape that we could kind of use and we, we did. We, we literally taped, taped, taped mics in shot. Wow. So you, I'm not going to tell you where they are because hopefully they'll never be seen. Um, yeah, the cast helped a hell of a lot. Viola was amazing with that. She led the way. She, she literally, we gave her the microphone. She hit it away and we didn't ask questions. She sounded great most of the time, unless she happened to hit her, her chest plate, um, <laughs> which obviously didn't work for anybody with anything like that. But yeah, the cast were amazing like that. They helped a lot. Costume department were, were on our side, mm -hmm. um, always there to help us when we had to hide something, move a pack or change it from one side to another. Um, we, did, we did as much of that as we could. And then we just employed as many booms as we could. I think at the time we had three, four booms up just pointing and getting what we could. We, we always ran a second boom just to try and point towards Atmos of some sort. And if not towards Atmos, at least towards generators or something that, that could give you a reference of what sound was there that we needed to try and remove. We, I mean, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's a complete waste of time, but it's just literally one track. So it, in my head, it's, I'd rather have it there than not. Um, and then, yeah, I just relied on, on my crew who were amazing. They really were. I, I have three girls in the team and then a boom swinger, Bruce, and we, they, 
they pull out the stops. They're the ones that get in there and get get into the into the show, get in there with the camera. Um, you mentioned the, the opening sequence. There was quite a few shots that we did that, that involved 360s, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. swinging cameras that were, were mounted to cranes that were hidden behind trees with lines running down and, and swinging all over the place. So yeah, it was a matter of rehearsing with them all the time and always being there with the with the camera guys, with the grips, being part of it so that we knew that when we came to shoot, we wouldn't be in the way. We, we, we knew what we were doing, we knew where we were gonna be. Mm -hmm. And then just get as much as you can. Um, yeah, like I say, it's very difficult to sometimes judge on set how much will be used because it's often preferable to build it up, but at least we give something, some kind of reference that Becky and Tony and them have got to be able to use to build on or to reference to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry. Uh, what else did we do? We just did whatever we could. We just, <laughs> you know, if something sounded interesting, we'd try and get it clean. If if we could, if we couldn't, we'd try and get it later. Mm -hmm. We obviously aim for as much natural sound as possible. So right. if there were things like horses on set, if there were things like carts being dragged, if there were bodies being moved, anything like that, we tried to get as much as possible to try and drown out the, the world around us. Um, where we started filming was actually pretty pleasant because it is very far away from civilization. But you still have airplanes coming over every once in a while, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, when we got down back down to Cape Town, it was a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. And then also the voices, which, which Becky talked about and Tony talked about, was, it was a difficult one for us because we were in South Africa. We're not in Benin. And, and also the language doesn't really exist anymore. We created a language for, for the show. It was, yeah, there were a lot of challenges. Um, like I said, we just try and get as much clean as we can and try and find as many things as possible. And then hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's there somewhere and somebody hears it. Goes, oh, that'll work. This will help. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we pass it on to to post and Becky and Tony, I think everybody did a fantastic job there, especially from the stories I'm hearing about what was so. Yeah. And, you know, Becky, is there anything you would like to, uh, to add to that before I, I move on to Tony with one last question? So we're talking about the battles, right? Yes. So one thing, the actresses all did their own stunts. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> there, was, there was no room to hide in that. Um, Gina was looking for a very organic sound with the battles and yet, a thing about this film is that it's rated PG-13. So there was not a lot of bloodletting and yet you needed to sell it. And so we needed the audience to feel the brutality of those battles and those weapons. So I started, you know, scouring my collection of uh, to get the right sounds for the machetes. That was our first, the first thing I was looking for is the heavy, deep, dark sound of those machetes hitting, hitting swords, hitting each other, hitting the ground, all the different, the weight of those machetes was so important, yeah. right? And then we had swords and then we had spears with iron tips and we had chains and we had ropes and our lovely rope sequence with, with Nawi where she's swinging the rope with the machete on the end and we were so able good. to lose the music and have that sound just beautiful. Um, but it was the br brutality of those sequences and get, you know hitting flesh and cutting throats and all those different sounds were so detailed in not just the sound of it, but the, you know, the sound of the blood, the sound of a squish, the sound of a throat, the, the, the vocal, um, each one just detailed out specifically for what we're seeing on camera. And um, I'm very proud of all those battle sequences because, uh, you know, they're brutal and they're realistic and you have those up close battles that are right in our faces. And yet we have that second degree battle. And then the third you know, exactly. so that it really envelops us and not only just what's happening up front, but the second and third degree of the of the battles. And there was so much time taken, just one little one little story about Naniska fighting Oba. She first sees Oba and she's angry and she sends the warriors off. She's there alone with her machete to fight him in the street. But at that time, she's emotionally vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. She's not really re ready mentally to fight him. And yet she takes him on. And in sound effects, we helped sell that by her hits not being so perfect, things not being as heavy. Not so on her side of it, she's she's hitting him and she's doing things, but vocally, she's breathing more, she's giving more effort. There's so much more vulnerability in her fighting him in that sequence mm -hmm. that is just lends itself to where she is emotionally. Wow. And then when you go to her last sequence where she fights him to the end 
different vocals from her, different breathing from her, different weight on that machete, a totally different mindset for Naniska that she is out to take him out. And, and I think sonically, we were able to just, we just changed it up. So one time she's vulnerable and at the end she is determined. And uh, I love that sound is able to, to do that. Yeah, thank you so, so much for sharing that. That's really, really fascinating. I love that you uh, explained that. Um, and just to wrap things up on a final note, Tony, um, Becky already mentioned the PG-13 rating, um, and I'm really in interested or curious about the process of mixing these big battles because, you know, um, on the one hand, we don't see um, a lot of bloodshed and a lot of gore, but we very much hear it uh, to an extent. So, if, if, Tony, if you could just talk about, you know, the challenge of walking that fine line of making these battles sound realistic, um, as realistic as possible, and staying within the boundaries of that PG-13 rating. Sure, sure. Well, you know, <clears throat> uh... It all comes from from Gina. She, you know, she's very much into detail. Um, she very much wanted to capture the intensity um, that that she she wanted the intensity from sound that she had captured on camera. And so um, and Becky, you know, built out each detailed, like she's saying, every single hit, every single as as we go through the scenes. Um, let's, let's take the the big oil battle at the end. You know, we have our, our heroes and our heroes are foreground. And we go to each one of them and each one of their weapons is different. Each one sounds different. Um, the strikes are all different and, and we're hearing blood and gore and, and, and that kind of thing. And that's something that Gina liked. She liked hearing that because um, obviously we don't see it, so we hear it. And it's a technique we use quite a bit. You know, your mind will really fill in things that you're not actually seeing just because of what your ears are telling you. So we use that technique a lot and we used it to really great effect um, during the battle scenes. The um, you know, we mix in in uh, the Dolby Atmos format so natively, so you know, we're able to take these giant scale battles and wrap them all around the audience and and again play with all the various levels of you know, we, we have all the foreground action, we have surrounding you know, mid level action, maybe 20, you know, 10 to 20 feet away, warriors fighting, screaming, hits, uh, um, body falls, all that kind of stuff, and then we have the thousands that we can wrap all around us that are you know, hundreds of feet away or whatever. So um, the, the format is absolutely brilliant for that um, mm -hmm. because we have so many speakers we can play with and take all the tracks and, and the sounds that, that Becky had brought to the mix and place them all around us. So that really brings you right into it. It makes it super visceral. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, Gina had done one other Atmos mix. She did um, Old Guard, you know, in yeah. Atmos, but this was, I think, the, for her first real Atmos experience, you know, to be really um, taken into that right in the middle of it, so to speak. So, um, and again, and then it's just going for the variety. And then you, you had mentioned Terrence's score. Terrence did an amazing score. That, and that, oh, you know, like Kevin O'Connell and I, you know, we've mixed a few movies together. So we have kind of, when we get into big action scenes, we kind of have, have this dance that we do in terms of, you know, what, what's really important to, to have playing at any given time and what's, which we feature, what would make it, you know, very interesting and cool to listen to. So, mm -hmm. um, so we worked our way through that and then, you know, as Becky referenced, the place where we've taken the music all the way out, where now we really has her moment. That's her big moment. Whole movies led up to that. Mm -hmm. So um, and so we do those kind of techniques to really pull the listener in, and and make them a part of it. And um, you know, again, this is this movie. The track of this movie is is one of my all time favorites that I've ever worked on. Um, you know, and and uh, so proud of it. Yeah, I can imagine. I can only agree. And um, it, the battle scenes turned out so incredibly well. And I think that's a perfect note to end on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But uh, thank you so much to the three of you for talking me through your process. It was really fascinating. And congratulations on the success of this movie. I mean, it's been amazing. Thank, thank you. you so much.